is on the ILS, 25 left, slow, I know, 185, heavy LA, turn on my 25, left, turn on number two, following Tempe, heavy airbus three, a mile final. Okay, number two. What's going on guys, Flyby Simulations here, and welcome back to another video in my Aircraft's Dissected series, where we delve into every switch, knob, and display in the cockpit of the Zebo Mod Boeing 737-800. In the previous video, we covered the main inboard display unit, which houses the navigation display, along with the bottom row of buttons and knobs on the EFIS panel, so if you haven't seen that video yet, I highly recommend you to check it out. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at this MCP, or Mode Control Panel, situated right in the middle of the pilot's view. I want to keep the intro short, so here's the list of things I failed to explain properly in the previous video as per usual, so you can pause the video and take a look at it if you so please. So without further ado, let's jump into the flight deck. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the flight deck of the Boeing 737-800, and quite specifically to this MCP panel right in front of the pilots. Now this panel consists of probably one of the most important sets of buttons and knobs in the entire flight deck, as it allows pilots to control the aircraft's speed, altitude, heading, vertical speed, and allows holistic control over the autopilot and auto throttle systems within the aircraft. So before we get started, I just want to say that in this video, I'll give a detailed description of what each and every switch and knob does and its overall functionality in flight. But to truly see their effect on the aircraft, you're going to have to wait for the full flight video with the Zebo 737 coming out very shortly. Lastly, I must once again reiterate that a lot of the concepts I cover in this video will include references to at least the previous two episodes, such as the course selector, the LNAV and VNAV modes, and so on. So if you haven't seen the previous two episodes, I highly recommend you to watch them before watching this one. So, let's not waste any more time and get right into exploring this panel. So, starting off on the left as usual, we have the Course Selector knob, which basically allows pilots to fly to and from a whole host of different navigational beacons on the ground, such as VOR stations, NDBs or non-directional beacons, as well as ILS beacons used during instrument-aided landings. Turning this knob while having the appropriate navigation frequency tuned into the nav radios provides pilots with appropriate indications on the ND, or navigation display, as you might remember from the previous video where we looked at the green bearing line after tuning in the Watsonville Municipal VOR frequency into the radios. There are two of these on the MCP panel, one for the captain and one for the first officer, and both of them can be used individually as per the pilot's liking to help fly the particular approach. Coming underneath here, we have the Flight Director switch. Now if you remember from Episode 3, these switches are extremely important, as without having them switched on, the entire autopilot system basically doesn't work. Additionally, they also provide these pink crosshairs on the PFD, which allows pilots to see their desired pitch and roll axis of the aircraft during climbs, descents, as well as during turns. As for the switches themselves, flicking the switch up switches the flight director on, and pilots normally turn these on before engines start at the departure airport and only switch them off after having landed at the arrival airport. Additionally, this MA light on top of one of these flight director switches implies that this side is the master and the other side is the slave. This means that, in this case, most of the primary navigation systems in the aircraft will get data from the left flight management computer, as this system on the left is the master. Whichever switch gets flicked on first becomes the master, and the second switch to be flicked on automatically becomes the slave. Coming here, we have the main auto throttle arm switch, which controls the engine performance during various phases of flight and works in conjunction with the overall flight management system to assist the aircraft in going from point A to B. Flicking the switch up arms the auto throttle system and flicking the switch down obviously switches it off and prevents the system from taking control of the throttles, thereby allowing manual control over the thrust levers by the pilots. Note that the auto throttle system may also be turned off by pressing the tiny buttons on both the thrust levers, but more on that in episode 2 of the series, so go check that out if you want more information. Moving further right, we come to this panel, which includes a display as well as some buttons allowing pilots to control the speed characteristics of the aircraft. Starting off with this display right here, this represents the indicated airspeed of the aircraft that the pilots can select using this knob down here. <laughs> 
Setting a speed value in here and pushing this speed button will instruct the auto throttle mode to fly the aircraft at that specific speed by altering engine thrust. Pretty self-explanatory. This N1 button right next to the speed button allows pilots to set takeoff thrust during the takeoff roll. Additionally, this button may also be used during a go-around, when immediate high thrust is required to start climbing the aircraft during an aborted landing sequence. We'll get into the N1 settings and what it is specifically when we look at these display units over here in the next video, as well as during the FMC programming video when we do the Zebo mod full flight. Finally, this button to the left of the speed selection knob, labeled CO, stands for Change Over, and allows pilots to select the speed on this display as a Mach number instead of indicated airspeed in knots. This may be used when ATC asks the pilots to speed up or slow down during the cruise phase of the flight. As for the Speed Intervene button on the right of this knob, we'll come to it in a second after we look at some other autopilot systems. The same is true for this level change button at the bottom, as I feel you guys need a little bit more knowledge about some other systems in the autopilot section before explaining this button in detail, so we'll come to it in a second. So, coming to the right here, we have the VNAV and LNAV buttons, which, as you again may remember from episode 3, stand for Vertical Navigation and Lateral Navigation, respectively. These modes, when engaged, basically obey every single instruction programmed into the flight management computer before flight, including speed restrictions, altitude constraints, headings needed to get to various waypoints on the route, and so on, to fly the aircraft from point A to B. The LNAV system is responsible for the roll axis of the aircraft, and is responsible for turning the aircraft from one waypoint to the next, as programmed into the FMC. The VNAV mode is responsible for controlling the vertical axis of the aircraft, thereby dynamically manipulating the aircraft's pitch and speed to maintain the vertical profile programmed into the FMC. When these systems both work in conjunction, they control every single control axis in the aircraft to allow the plane to fly as accurately as it can on its specified route. Alright, now that we know what LNAV and VNAV do, let's come back to the speed control panel and look at the speed intervention button. Now, as mentioned before, when VNAV is engaged, the autopilot systems will manage the speed and altitude of the aircraft using the constraints that have been programmed into the FMC. In fact, the entire speed display will go blank, signifying that VNAV has taken control over the speed and altitude characteristics of the aircraft. However, say that pilots wish to use VNAV for its altitude component, but want to set the speed manually, they can press the speed intervention button and dial in a specific speed. This will mean that the aircraft will follow all altitude constraints programmed into the FMC, but the aircraft will only obey the speed that has been dialed manually into the speed control panel. It might sound confusing at first, but when you see it in action, it'll make complete sense. Arming these modes also shows their appropriate indications on the PFD, as we saw in earlier episodes of this series. So, in the middle of these LNAV and VNAV buttons, we have the heading control knob, which, as you probably guessed, allows pilots to fly a particular heading when selected on this display using this knob. This system may be used when pilots are flying pre-specified approaches or departures around the world, but are mostly used when air traffic control vector the aircraft around immediately after takeoff or during approach. For example, ATC might instruct the pilots to turn right heading 340, so pilots would select 340 on this display and push this heading select button, causing the aircraft to automatically turn the aircraft in that direction. Also note that manipulating this knob shows a visual representation of the direction being selected using this pink line and bug on this ND, as well as on this partial heading indicator on this PFD. Lastly, the eagle eyed among you might have noticed that there are actually two knobs on this panel, and you're quite right. The smaller knob, as we just saw, obviously allows pilots to select the specific heading they wish to fly, but this larger knob at the back allows pilots to select the maximum bank angle during the turn. This ranges from 10 degrees and goes up in increments of 5 degrees all the way till 30 degrees. This is especially important when pilots wish to make tight or shallow turns depending on the phase of flight.
Okay, so I've changed the view up a little bit here as we transition towards the right of this MCP panel. So all of the effects of the next few buttons will be seen on the first officer's displays instead of the captain's. Starting with this VOR lock button underneath the LMAV button, this serves two major functions. Number one is that it allows pilots to let the autopilot systems within the aircraft fly certain VOR radios instead of flying them manually. Certain airports around the world are rather challenging to land at and sometimes have tricky approaches which require the pilots to use this button to reduce their workloads when flying VOR approaches. The second function of this button is that it intercepts the localizer when performing an ILS landing at a runway. The localizer represents the lateral component of the ILS, or Instrument Landing System Beacon, and allows the aircraft to get aligned with the center line of the runway during an ILS approach. Pressing this button, after having tuned the appropriate ILS frequency into the nav radios and selecting the correct approach course into the course selectors, will automatically instruct the plane to intercept this localizer and fly the approach straight onto the runway. Coming down to this APP button, this button acts as a sister button to the VOR lock button we just looked at. Pushing this button after having tuned the appropriate ILS frequency into the nav radios will instruct the plane to intercept the glide slope component of the ILS beacon, which is used to align the aircraft vertically with respect to the runway. When the aircraft intercepts both the localizer and glide slope, it is then perfectly aligned with the center line of the runway and is descending at just the right rate to touch down near the start of the runway threshold. Again, if you don't necessarily understand what these terms mean, we'll take a closer look at these concepts when we do a full flight with this aircraft later in the series, and I promise that you'll walk away with much more clarity. Coming to the right, we have the altitude control knob, which, as you probably guessed, allows pilots to select an altitude that the aircraft needs to climb or descend to. However, there are a few caveats to this, so let me explain them to you. Now, unlike the speed or heading control panels, the altitude control panel doesn't necessarily have a single button that can be pressed to instruct the aircraft to fly to a particular altitude instantly. Instead, there are three primary methods that the pilots must choose between, depending on their use case scenario, to be able to get the aircraft to a certain altitude. The first one is by using this altitude intervention button. What this button essentially does is that it cancels any altitude constraints programmed into the flight management computer. Most departure and arrival procedures will have certain specified altitudes that the aircraft must fly between at certain waypoints. For example, for this specific departure from San Francisco International Airport, the chart specifies that the aircraft must be below 3,000 feet at this point. This constraint will automatically be programmed into the FMC when the pilots enter this waypoint into their route, as these procedures are updated monthly and each airline has access to the latest procedures at all times. However, if ATC has too much air traffic near the vicinity of the airport and wants to get our aircraft out of San Francisco as quickly as possible, they might instruct us to climb to flight level 190, or 19,000 feet. So, pilots can press this altitude intervention button, which will automatically cancel the 3,000 feet constraint that was programmed into the FMC, and will then select 19,000 feet in this display, and the aircraft will immediately begin climbing to this altitude. Now here's an important note. Do not press this button repeatedly, as every press basically cancels the next altitude constraint programmed into the FMC. So pressing this button 10 times due to impatience can result in you accidentally cancelling important descent altitude constraints at your arrival airport if you are on a short flight and have less than 10 waypoints in your route. Okay. The second way to get to a certain altitude is by simply using the vertical speed button down here, and using the scroll wheel to adjust the rate at which the aircraft will climb or descend to a certain altitude in feet per minute. Also note that arming the vertical speed mode will also activate the speed mode on the left, so you will have to dial in a speed that the aircraft will maintain while getting to this altitude at this vertical speed. Finally, the last way to set the altitude for the aircraft is by using this level change mode we previously looked at near the speed control knob.
By pressing this button, you can then select a particular speed on this panel and also dial in an altitude on this panel. The aircraft will automatically decide the appropriate rate of climb or descent to maintain this specific speed and to get to this altitude. And lastly, of course, you always have VNAV mode, which will basically take you from waypoint to waypoint on as perfect a vertical profile as possible while obeying all altitude constraints, but we already spoke about that. As for the altitude hold button down here, this will basically stop your climb or descent to any altitude specified on this selector and will level the plane off at the exact altitude when you pressed this button. For example, if you are climbing to 15,000 feet and you press this button when you are at 5,000 feet, the, pl the plane will stop its climb to 15,000 feet and maintain 5,000 feet of altitude. And that's that for the altitude panel. Coming to this final panel on this MCP over here, we have the main autopilot control panel, which houses the main autopilot arm and disengage switches. So just like most other important systems in the aircraft, there are two autopilot command systems, A and B. These two switches over here, therefore, are the main command arm switches. Normally, only one of these buttons are pressed during flight to switch on the autopilot systems within the aircraft. The only time both of these buttons are pressed at the same time is when this approach mode is armed during an ILS landing. When this is done, pilots can switch on both autopilot systems to be able to perform an auto land procedure, where the automatic systems in the aircraft will completely take over and land the aircraft onto the runway during harsh weather conditions such as dense fog. Also note that without pressing at least one of these buttons, none of the previous buttons on the MCP panel will work. Their corresponding lights will light up and the displays will show the selected values, but the aircraft will not obey any instructions programmed into the MCP without having at least one autopilot system activated. Alright, coming further below, we have these two CWS buttons. Now, I'll be honest with you guys, I have never really used these buttons when flying the Zebo mod, but upon researching it on this website, I found that it is extremely useful in certain situations. CWS stands for Control Wheel Steering and allows pilots to set a particular pitch and roll setting on their control column and yoke and have the aircraft fly that specific pitch and roll setting automatically. It's basically a more advanced version of the trim system we explored in detail in episode 2 and removes the need for pilots to constantly apply positive pressure on their yoke or control column during a climb. It is especially useful during initial climbs after taking off from airports, as well as during turbulence mid-flight. Finally, coming down here, this is the main autopilot disengage switch, which, you guessed it, disengages the autopilot systems. Simply flick the switch down to disengage the autopilot. Note that when you flick the switch down, it not only disengages the autopilot, but also prevents you from engaging it again by pressing the main command buttons you need to first flick the disengage switch back up before flicking the autopilot systems on again. Just thought you should know that. So ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this aircraft's dissected episode, covering the mode control panel or MCP. If you've stuck around so far, congratulations. You now have a sound understanding of how pilots can control different autopilot and auto throttle related systems within the aircraft. Now, I must also mention that all of the documentation and websites I used to research for this video are linked down below in the description, including a written text version of this entire video, if you prefer to read those and understand more about this aircraft. That being said, the next episode in this series will focus on some of the miscellaneous buttons and levers located right in front of the pilots, and will also be the final episode of our flight deck familiarization portion of the series. The next four or five episodes after that will have us do a full flight on this aircraft from point A to point B, where we will be using all of the systems we have journeyed through so far in the series. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to perform a full stop landing at the like button and the subscribe button, and press the bell icon for future notifications from this channel. Also, be sure to fly by the comments section and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to answer for you. As usual, thanks for flying by.